This week, we revisit a report we did on the initial Wild of Africa shows concerning the epidemic of coup d'etats in West Africa. Burkina Faso is back in the headlines for having a string of government takeovers for over six decades. Also, we tell you the problem of colorism, which is driving women to apply harmful skin lighting products to become fairer. This is Wild of Africa with me, Eric Njoka. The show starts right now. Somali authorities say a top leader of the Al-Shabaab extremist group has been killed in a joint operation by the Somali National Army and international partner forces. In retaliation, fighters targeted the local Somali government headquarters in the Hiran region, leaving 20 people dead and 36 wounded in a town at the center of a recent mobilization against the extremists. Lesotho is all set to hold a parliamentary election amid failures by its politicians to pass constitutional reforms meant to end the years of political instability in the southern African mountain kingdom. The all Basotho convention has run the country since 2017, but divisions within the party have given it to prime ministers over five years. Prime Minister Moiketsi Majoro declared a state of emergency after legislators failed to pass two bills meant to end political volatility in Parliament. Kenya's new president says the cabinet has effectively lifted the country's ban on openly cultivating genetically modified crops. Reversing a decade-old decision as the East African country struggles with food security and a deadly drought. Earlier this year, the United States, via its trade representative's office, criticized Kenya over its ban and the effect on U.S. agricultural exports to East Africa's commercial hub. The ban also affected food aid. Burkina Faso is one of the few West African countries that had a coup ridden history. Six years after independence, the country's first military coup in 1966 led to numerous subsequent coups. The country had popular military officials who ended up toppling one another to become heads of state. We look at the history of wars for the Burkina Bay in this next report. January 2022, Ouagadougou is under siege. Uniformed soldiers announce on television that they have taken charge and put an end to the power of Burkina Faso's president, Rock Mark Christian Kabori. Streets erupt in jubilation over the coup. Lieutenant Colonel Paul Henry Sandaogo Damiba becomes the leader of the junta and eventually president of Burkina Faso's transitional government. Damiba stays on the fort for eight months. He even boldly headed to the United Nations General Assembly and made this statement. On the 24th of January 2022, a group of young patriots was forced to assume their responsibilities in the public management of the affairs of the state in the face, of course, of the drift of the political governance in place and the growing insecurity in our country, as well as the progressive and continuous disintegration of the state. We have put an end to a democratically elected but chaotic regime. That was the straw that broke the camel's back. His Julius back home were fuming and irked by their so-called strongman. And then, on September 30th, 2022, Damiba's fate was announced by his own comrades on state television. The Lieutenant Colonel Paul Henry Sandago Damiba is dismissed as president of the MPSR. Two coups in one year. A first for the West African country but does not alter the tradition and history of coup d'etats. This is a reminder of the coups that have marked the country since independence in 1960. 1966, January. The army seized power following strikes and demonstrations against austerity. President Maurice Yameogo, in power since independence, was replaced by Chief of Staff Abubakar Sangole Lamizana. In 1974, following a major political crisis, the constitution was suspended and the assembly dissolved. 1980, November, after 14 years as head of state, 
President Sangole Lamizana was overthrown. A military committee for recovery for national progress led by Colonel Sei Zerbo took power. 1982, November, a council for the salvation of the people chaired by Major Jean-Baptiste Uedraogo overthrew Colonel Sei Zerbo. Captain Thomas Sankara, who played an important role in the coup, was appointed Prime Minister. 1983, August, Captain Thomas Sankara, who had been removed from power in the meantime, became head of a national council of the revolution and established a democratic and popular revolution. The coup was led by his brother in arms, Captain Blaise Compaore. 1987, October, Blaise Compaore, whose differences over how to lead the revolution pitted him against Thomas Sankara, took power in a deadly coup. Sankara, who was considered the father of the Burkina Bay Revolution, was killed along with 12 of his collaborators. The trial of the assassination of Thomas Sankara, which is still the subject of a cult, opened in October 2021 in Ouagadougou. End. 2014, October. Blaise Compaore was ousted by the street for wanting to change the constitution and remain in power. Following the latest takeover, the French embassy in Burkina Faso was targeted by angry protesters and a fire broke out as the situation remained tense in Ouagadougou. Protesters believed that Damiba was getting support from France. Regional mediators were headed to Burkina Faso in the wake of the second coup. Amid concerns, the latest power grab could further postpone elections and deepen the region's Islamic extremist violence. Ousted Paul Henry Sandaogo Damiba fled to the neighboring nation of Togo, following talks mediated by religious leaders. Burkina Faso's new leader, 34-year-old Captain Ibrahim Traore, is officially head of state pending future elections. While ECOWAS, a 15-nation West African bloc, has reached an agreement to hold a new vote by July 2024. It, however, remains unclear whether that date would still hold. Bureau Report, Wild of Africa. The port city in northern Mozambique, liberated from insurgency a year ago, is slowly coming back to life. In the poor and predominantly Muslim province of Cabo Delgado, bordering Tanzania, the Al-Shabaab, an armed terror group affiliated with the Islamic State, have been active since 2017. Here now is a report on rebuilding Mosimboa. This was the remnant of war in Mozambique in Mosimboa. Three years after the surge of insurgency, Mozambican army finally succeeded in setting up their base in August 2020. This is the city today. People are moving freely despite the presence of the army at a distance. The Mozambican health authorities are reopening most of the 34 health units wrecked by terrorists in the northern province of Cabo Delgado. The terrorist raids led to over 500 health staff fleeing to safer areas. But with the recent improvement in security, these health workers are returning to their posts. Displaced people are also now returning. Since late July, small military detachments from other African countries have been arriving in the Cabo Delgado region after an agreement among the Southern African Development Community marked by delay and tensions. I feel safe here in Mukambio da Praia. I'm from here. I was born here. But if one day this conflict starts again in our district, I will stay here in Mukambo di Praia. I will no longer run away. I will fight against them and I will tell people not to run away. Hundreds of thousands of people have been displaced by the violence in Cabo Delgado. International concerns focused on the conflict in March this year 
when Al Shabaab, having seized Mazamboa, moved 80 kilometers north and attacked the coastal town of Palma. This led to the shelving of a major liquefied natural gas project of French company Total nearby, which Mozambique's government had hoped would be a lucrative program. That siege lasted four days, left dozens of locals and international contractors dead, and trapped tens of thousands of people without food or water for weeks. Although religious extremism, government marginalization and greed for the region's abundant natural resources have all been blamed, Al-Shabaab's motives remain opaque. The U.S. government designated the insurgents as an international terrorist organization, ISIS Mozambique, in March, although there is little known about the strength of the connections between the insurgents and the wider ISIS group, which has claimed credit for its activities. When we heard the shots, I started to flee in the bush with my family, in the banana plantations not far away. When they arrived, they destroyed the houses. They looted everything, as you can see. What happened to me, it also happened to my neighbor on this side and to my neighbor on the other side, whose house was destroyed. And now we are suffering because we lack food. We no longer have ways to make a living. An estimated 800,000 people have been displaced by an Islamist insurgency that has killed 3,000 people since 2017. The Cover Delgado reconstruction plan approved in September 2021 is budgeted at 300 million US dollars. About 200 million dollars are earmarked for short-term actions to be implemented within a year. Bureau Report, World of Africa. South Africa's ruling party, the African National Congress, is scheduled to host its 54th national conference in December. Now, with less than three months to go, the party has actively begun to nominate its preferred candidates for leadership positions from all provinces. However, analysts have said that the December conference is going to be the toughest one yet for the party amid factions, corruption allegations, and diminishing trust from its supporters. Our reporter, Carlden Ongmu, has filed this report. Black, Green and Gold Party the ANC is the only party that has ruled South Africa since 1994 when the first post-apartheid election voted Nelson Mandela as the president of the country. 24 years later, the People's Party is being questioned on whether it holds the same value as it did back then. The ANC is in a terrible state at the moment and as a former president of the party said, only the ANC can destroy the ANC, and it seems to be doing a very good job of that at the moment. Factionalism is almost the main mantra of the party, and this is destructive not only for the party itself, but for South Africa and South Africans. The local government election results last year were a clear indication that ANC is deeply wounded. For the first time in South Africa's democratic history, the support for the ruling party dipped below 50% votes. This definitely was a wake-up call for the ANC and its current leader, who is also the president of the country. He admits that the challenges the party is facing are huge. The challenges that the ANC is facing, both as a party and also in government, are huge. And at party level, the financial challenges we're facing are out there for everyone to see. Financial resources for political parties, especially the ANC, have dried up. Have dried up because of the legislation we've put in place, and those who used to fund the ANC because of the disclosure processes are now holding back. And as a result, the enormous expenses that the ANC goes through becomes under a great deal of pressure. In December, ANC will elect its new leaders, including its party president, who will automatically take over as the president of the country if the ANC wins the general elections in 2024.
various provinces and branches have been endorsing their preferred candidates. Ramaphosa, who is the sitting president of the ANC, is competing for a second term, but experts feel giving a chance to a woman leader might save the party. I'm disappointed just to see the lack of showing of female candidates within the ANC. In fact, it's a vote of no confidence in a female leader. And I think that shows just how unprogressive the ANC is. So in my final analysis, I think very little is going to change in, in December. ANC's 54th elective conference scheduled for December will mark a turning point, not just for the party, but for the general elections that is due in 2024. Will ANC members put aside the differences and come out stronger or will the party see further divisions and hate before going in for the elective conference? Only time will tell. This is Calden Almo from Johannesburg, South Africa for We On World Is One. 62 years ago, Nigeria attained its independence. Many country people say there is so much to celebrate for their achievements. The West African nation is heading to the polls next year. So what lies ahead for the country? And will the next government be able to wither all the challenges? Let's find out in this next report from Lagos. Africa's largest economy, Nigeria, celebrated its 62nd Independence Day. It was in 1960 when the nation became independent of the Great Britain, 62 years on, the country is mired with controversies from military rules, secession threats and alleged Islamization. This venue, Race Course, now renamed Tafar Balewa Square, is a hallowed ground where Nigeria's independence took place in 1960. 62 years down the line, the country still struggles to stay united as issues ranging from secession threat, ethnic domination and general unrest in major regions stares those in power in the face. In his last Independence Day broadcast on the 1st of October, President Mohamedou Buhari listed the successes of his government in tackling insecurity and economic issues. I then pledged to improve the economy, tackle corruption and fight insecurity. And this was further strengthened by my commitment to lift 100 million Nigerians out of poverty in 10 years as the central plank of my second term in 2019. But many blame Nigeria's founding fathers for lacking in the objectives of independence. Our founding fathers never set a goal, a definite goal. They never created a consensus you know, among themselves and among Nigerians about what the, 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 what the, the objective of independence was. So we, have, we had it then. I mean, this problem that, that, that has been trailing us started from that time when we had no consensus. So everybody was defining the objective of independence in his own way. For veteran journalist Niyi Babade, Nigeria at 62 is still the same old story. I don't see what the Nigerians are celebrating. Uh, are they going to be celebrating the valued currency? You know, uh, or uh, non functional go go government uh, policies and what have you, bad roads, uh, farming and going on in the land and all that stuff. Most of the Nigerians feel that there is so much more to be done rather than just celebrate. The call for the right choice of leaders as the country gets ready for elections in 2023, dominating their thoughts. Generally hoped that the major contenders of the 2023 general elections have what it takes to restore the country to its height. Louisa Olani, Lagos, Nigeria. We on World is One. Cameroonian Ministry of Health has imposed a ban on skin lighting products following a spate of high profile cases of consumers developing skin cancers. Despite this, shops selling skin bleaching products continue to prosper, with plenty of women on Cameroon's streets seemingly benefiting from their use. 
Here's a report on why this age-old desire to make your skin fairer is proving to be detrimental to your health. There is furore in Douala, Cameroon. The anger is against companies that never test their products scientifically and contain dangerous levels of chemicals that further inhibit the production of melanin, a substance produced in the body after being exposed to the sun. The government is now taking action after cases of skin cancer were rising. But the question is, what causes the desire for men and women to bleach their skin? It is men who push women to lighten their skin. They tend to say that brown women are more beautiful. Black women, on the other hand, tend to be neglected. When they see a brown woman out and about, they appreciate her. And ultimately, girls feel obliged to lighten their skin to please men. Colorism, or rather skin tone bias, is an intra-racial phenomenon which negatively affects the attitudes and opinions. People of color across the globe hold about each other. Skin tone bias manifests itself into stereotypes and prejudices, especially in terms of beauty standards. It is this form of societal prejudice that has forced many, especially in West, Central and South Africa, to resort to finding products that are laced with hydroquinone. It is banned in the European Union since 2001 because of the risk of cancer and genetic mutations. Some of these substances, when ingested, can cause diabetes, obesity, hypertension or kidney or liver failure. We can consider that out of 10 patients consulted, we can consider that there are at least three who present signs related to the practice of voluntary depigmentation. Indeed, this is a very present issue and could be considered a public health problem. This is because the number of people who practice voluntary depigmentation is very significant. Despite all these horror stories, men and women believe that they will become more beautiful after using these products. African women feel more beautiful with stripped skin, but from my point of view, I don't think it's advisable. The best thing is to be clean, maintain that cleanliness, and if you are going to be pretty, you will be pretty. Since the ban, police have launched raids much to the chagrin of the sector's players who claim that some seizures don't distinguish between the products that are banned by the government and those that are not. The WHO in 2019 said that the skin lightening industry is one of the fastest growing worldwide and it was estimated to be worth $31.2 billion by the year 2024. However, there is already a black market for all these products. 25-year-old Togolese mechanic Surue Ejareo Malazue has created his own car, get this, from recycled materials. He is now in the process of creating a second vehicle. He is our trailblazer this week and here's a report from Lome. From a distance, it looks like your normal sports buggy, but it has a unique story. This 4x4 is 100% made in Togo using recycled materials. And the creator is a 25-year-old self-taught engineer, Surue Ejario Malazue. Malazue has a passion for sports cars, but since he could not afford to buy one himself, he decided that his only option was to build one. I finished secondary school in 2016 and after that I started my own business, selling and repairing mobile phones and computers. It's because of that I could afford to build this car. Work got underway about a year ago in his workshop in the forever district of the capital. And the first model has been out on the road for some time now. The young inventor has named the car Raf Extraptor, a play on his own nickname, Ralph. I used a lot of recycled parts. I paid for a few new ones, but not many. The majority of the parts used are scraps of other machines. From motorcycles, from cars, it depends what I find. I get the parts from everywhere, which is how I manage. 
Malazuwe says there are plenty of people who are impressed by the car and he's received several orders for one, but has not responded as he's currently working on fixing problems with his garage. His next step after that will be to make another one. Malazuwe is the pride of Togo. I know that I will always reach my goals and that if I start something, I'll finish it. In May, he met with the country's Prime Minister, who later tweeted that she was amazed and charmed by this genius, further reiterating the government's commitment to support him. Bureau Report, World of Africa, Weon. That's our time this week on World of Africa. Visit our website and social media platforms to watch all our shows and share your thoughts with us. American Joker, thank you very much for watching and goodbye. <laughs>